Hi, I'm Ed Hammerly from NJ Renewable Energy. Welcome to my passive house. What is a passive house? Well, essentially, a passive house is a home that is extremely well insulated, extremely airtight, and, and ventilated. And when you do this, and you create such a design of which you're going to see here, uh, you have a house that uses approximately one-tenth the energy of a regular home. So you might have, you, you, you'll see there's some additional expenses that go along with creating the shell like this, and they're typically around 15%. However, when you're done, and for the lifetime of the home, you're using one-tenth the energy. So this is the way we're going to build homes in this country from here on out. Um, it, it's unique. It's been being done in, in Europe for years, and it's made its way to the United States. But with energy costs rising um, and uh, having fossil fuels that are in limited supply, this is the way we need to build. So it's quite obvious that we are going to recover our added costs of materials rather quickly when our heating and cooling demands are reduced by 90% for the life of the structure. But what is overlooked many times is that when you are drastically reducing a home's energy needs on the construction side, it will instantly save you money on the heating and cooling systems. For instance, if you needed a 5-ton unit and now you need a 1-ton unit, obviously you're going to save money. Additionally, if you're considering renewables, such as solar, your return on investment for a passive house could be immediate. I just, I just want to mention one thing before we get going here. This is the way I chose to build a passive home. Um, there are a hundred million ways to do this. You don't have to use double stud framing. You don't have to use spray foam. I chose to do this. However, you could use something that could be cheaper, faster, um, more, uh, more sustainable. So at the end of the day, uh, you want the same thing. We're going to go over this project from the ground up. And the foundation is just as critical as anything else. This is ICF, Insulating Concrete Forms. Let's take a look at how they work. But before we do, keep in mind that 25 to 30 percent of a home's heat loss can be attributed to an uninsulated foundation. We have two and a half inches of polystyrene, two and a half inches of polystyrene, and in this particular case, eight inches of concrete pour. The two and a half inches on either side will give us an R value of 20, all by itself. But because of the, the thermal mass in the middle of the concrete, we will get upwards around R50 which considering a regular cinder block or a concrete wall is about a one or two, we're talking about a massive savings in energy. And so not to misrepresent the product, the R value I'm speaking of is really an effective R value, and that is based on the reduction of air infiltration, the thermal mass, and the insulation R value of the ICF. Now before we go further about the ICF build block form, let's jump back to the footings. One part of the project I wanted to show you was a thing called form a drain. Uh, typically forms are, are, you, are done with say a 2x10 or 2x12 or 2x8 depending upon what you're trying to do here. But this footing um, in this particular case is being formed by form a drain which is made by certainty. There's their plug. Anyway, the way it works is this plastic material you see, you see here has grew, or slits in it on one side and it's, and it's solid on the other. And basically, you just form your footing just like you normally would and you just make sure that you have the, the openings on the outside of the footing. So on this side, they'll be facing the inside of the house and on this side, on the outside of the, of the footing, they'll be facing the uh, outside. That way, when there's either water trapped on the inside or water trapped on the outside, it will uh, basically get into the inside of the form. And since it's all level, it'll ultimately find its uh, low point. Uh, on this particular one, this is actually for the radon. We're actually killing two birds with one stone here. We have the upper portion where we pierce the, the form and we vent radon gases. We'll run this into a, up into the wall and we'll vent it either out the outside wall or up through the, through the roof. And on the other side, which I'll show you, um, this hole is lower. And basically, it'll, the water will drain out and we'll, we'll get it into a sump, sump pump. Um, my feeling is this 
potentially has it has a sustainable aspect to it. You're not using wood every single time you form, and you're sort of killing two birds with one stone, actually three. You're not re, uh, wasting lumber to make forms. You're then getting a, essentially a French drain, and you're also getting radon capability. So it, it's, it would appear to me that it's a win-win, it's a but at the very least, it's a very functional system that we're using in this application. I apologize for not having this information prior to filming the first segment, but I'm happy to report that the former drain is actually made of 92% recycled material and is LEED certified. So it's a great functioning product and sustainable. The build block ICF is complete. It is now time to pour cement. At this point, this process is just like any other poured concrete foundation. Now that we've created a highly insulated foundation, we must work equally as hard to do this with the slab. This is where we use our first application of Heat Lock Soy 200 a bio-based and recycled material spray foam polyurethane. This two-inch coating will act as a vapor barrier and insulator. Once complete, our slab and foundation will be completely disconnected from the ground, creating a highly efficient and insulated structure. The foam pieces you see laying on the ground are just used as a depth gauge. Once spraying is complete, we're ready to pour the slab. All right, now that we're inside, we're gonna start off with the double stud framing. You don't have to do double stud framing. There's other methods, but this is what I went with. I personally think it's one of the best ways to go. You're also using conventional lumber where contractors and framers are familiar with this stuff, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel with these guys here. They know what they're doing. It's just a matter of doing it differently. Anyway, this is called a double stud wall. We have the outer wall, 2 by 4 or, and the inner wall here, which is 2 by 4 Ultimately, here we're getting about 9 inches. We're going to be spray foaming about five inches, maybe even six. Uh, it comes a point where we'll get into that as well once we get to spray foam. But it, there does come a point where spraying it, foam past five or six inches, it's already about 98% efficient. So to spend the extra money for very little efficiency um, doesn't really make much sense. Um, one major benefit to double stud framing is right here. What it does is prevent thermal bridging. And what thermal bridging is, is when heat can transfer through, in this case, the wood material from one side to the other. So if this was a two by eight or a two by six or what have you, the heat could basically get from this side, either side depending upon the climate or the time of the season. It would basically go into the wood and transfer out to the opposite side. You'll see this in the winter time in northern climates where you'll see the roof rafters on a house in the snow or with a lot of ice on the roof, you'll literally see each rafter. And the reason that is because the heat from the inside of the house is transferring through the, the joist, uh, excuse me, the rafter, and making its way to the outside. Well, what we're going doing here is trying to have this wall be completely separate from the other wall. So in addition to it not touching one another, we're also going to have foam in between here. So it, it does a great job of insulating the house. Here's another example in this thermal image of what I'm talking about. The brighter and lighter the color, the more heat being lost. And we can easily see the studs and rafters in this photo.
All right, here's a corner of a double stud wall. You'll notice that I can put my arm through here and it's all open inside here. We want as little material as possible in here. The less wood and the more foam that we can put in, the better. Now we're going to have a little bit of thermal bridging through the subfloor, but you can see here we've done our best to separate the outside wall from the inside wall. To head off some questions that you may have, it is not required to stagger studs, nor is it required to have big distances between the studs from front to back. S scientific studies were done and sh shown here show that very little heat transfer is gained by either staggering or having larger distances. All right, here's a great example of where double stud walls work really, really well. You'll see here I have a bunch of jacks and studs here that are carrying the load of this wall here um, with all these windows. If this was a normal wall, we'd have sheetrock up against this, and we'd have very little, we'd have no insulation, and, and the insulating value of this wood is, is poor at best. Now that we have double stud wall and we have several inches out past this, we'll spray our five or six inches of foam against the sheathing here, but where it comes to the jacks, we'll spray out even further and make sure we get this all insulated very well so it's nice and tight. As you can see, we use conventional lumber here as well. Um, in hindsight, I think the potential of using truss would be better. Uh, the roof line, if, as you'll notice on this house, is pretty fancy and has a bunch of different hips and, and dog legs and so forth. So a little bit complicated to do truss. Anyway, what we're going to do to compensate for that is we're going to only be spraying, as mentioned, about five or six inches of foam. But we, we don't want this thermal bridging to occur. So this is a perfect example of where you would get thermal bridging. If we were insulated on either side and this was exposed, the heat would transfer through the entire solid piece of lumber and make its way through the roof. What we're going to do is we're going to still going to spray here. We're spraying the envelope is actually the, is the ceiling, the, the rafters. So none of this here, none, nothing down lower, and the ceiling on the first floor will have insulation, which has other benefits too if you've done construction. But anyway, once we spray our five inches or six inches inside the bay, we're going to spray each rafter. So there'll be several inches of a spray foam around every rafter so that we're separating the outside um, from, from either side of the rafter so that no heat can transfer through and get to the outside. You just can't beat this product. It's going to fill every nook and cranny, every hole, every crevice that you could possibly imagine. There will be no air transferring through this wall whatsoever. Now everyone loves to talk about R value, and no doubt it's important. However, you could have a wall that's three foot thick and have it filled with bat insulation, but if air is flowing through it, it's not insulation, it's called an air filter. In my opinion, a far more important measuring device is the resistance to conductive heat flow. This is where Heat Lock Soy 200 spray foam is in a league of its own. As you will see, at 2 inches thick, we have a heat transfer resistance of 94.4%. In this passive house, every wall or ceiling has a minimum of 5 inches, giving us a heat transfer resistance of over 97%. This is why, during many times of the year, body heat, light bulbs, appliances will be enough BTUs to heat this entire home. You can really feel the heat coming off that when you first spray it. Yeah. Yeah. It is right now.
Another great advantage to the spray foam application is that we spray the envelope, the rafters, the outside walls, beyond the fact that we don't have insulation in the, in the bays between the, the joists of the ceiling, it's also conditioned space up there. So our HVAC unit or our ventilation system, none of the ductwork is being battered by either really hot temperatures in the summer or really cold temperatures in the winter. Another unique feature to Passive House is that there is no ridge vent, there is no soffit venting. We have this house very tight and well insulated and we'll deal with the other issues with having a home that's this tight as far as ventilation later. All right, we're, we're ready for sheetrock. And before we do that, let's just take a quick look and see what we've uh, come up with here. We've really filled in these spaces here. Um, as you, I'm sure you remember, these voids were about eight inches thick. We have filled them completely with spray foam. All cracks and areas where air potentially can get through are now closed up. And we're, we really have something here. Uh, this is going to be a super insulated, super airtight structure that's just going to outperform any building out there, period. All right, one thing we discussed before we had sprayed was about the roof rafters and the, the ability for heat to transfer through the rafter itself. As you'll see, we spray foam, not only did we spray in between each bay, that five or six inch thickness, but we went around each rafter in order to prevent any heat in the, in the attic space to transfer through. This was a unique situation in the house, so I thought I'd point it out. This is the vaulted ceiling in the bedroom area. This is the only section of the house where the roof rafters touched the sheetrock, so we weren't able to spray around the edge. So what we did is I cut some half-inch uh, foam board, and we padded out the, the rafters so that the sheetrock wouldn't touch directly on the rafter. You quickly forget how thick these walls are with the double stud, but this is what it looked like when we were done. 